also worth saying that um, there's often this Goldilocks paradigm when we talk about loading or a lot of things, to be honest, where it's like too much is a bad thing and too little is a bad thing. So we have to find this optimal area in the middle. Okay, so I do know that you have a very cool project going on in your lab. So tell us a little bit about what you've got going on, what you're working on. I know it's related to um, movement and uh, physical activity. So give us give us a, the breakdown. So in individuals who have had um, an ACL injury and subsequent reconstruction, we see that many individuals report lower levels of physical activity, mm -hmm. um, like within uh, years of, of the surgery and also um, altered like movement profiles. So one of those is kind of this like underloading of the Okay. Knee. I was going to ask you what a movement profile was. Yeah. So, well, I mean, it's really what you want to define it to be, right? Because like, if you, not to get too technical, but if you break down biomechanics, right? Like there's so many things, it's like different segments that you can look mm -hmm. at that would make a movement profile. We're just specifically looking at what's happening at the knee and okay. also like the, the physical activity uh, side of things. So you're essentially trying to relate physical activity to movement at the knee joint and whether or not those two things correlate with one another. Yeah, definitely. Um, because like I said, uh, we see some of these um, underloading not on a move, not only on a movement side in individuals after uh, reconstruction, but also on the physical activity side, right? Um, and so these also uh, have been associated with uh, poor uh, knee function, so like self-reported knee function okay. down the line, um, and also problematic um, cartilage compositional changes, uh, and even some uh, altered joint tissue metabolism as well. Wow. Um, and so what we're trying to look at with these relationships together um, is to see like, is there this kind of group of people that's underloading on both sides of things. Got it. So what parameters are you looking at specifically on the uh, mechanics side of things? Yeah, uh, great. So for the biomechanics, it's like vertical ground reaction force, right? right. Um, so that's gonna be the force that's gonna be applied to your body, mm -hmm. uh, right? And um, there's also going to be the forces that are occurring at your knee with like knee extension moment and also how much your knee is bending while you're moving, okay. which we, we refer to as knee flexion. Right, right. So are we underloading on top of also having decreases in physical activity? Because we know that underloading results in these poor outcomes, like you said, patient reported outcomes, but also you know, poor cartilage health, essentially. Yeah, absolutely. And mm -hmm. um, you bring up a, a, you're kind of alluding to like another interesting point too, which is that they're both modifiable, like in rehabilitation. So this is where like the athletic tra trainer side of me sort of comes out mm -hmm. where um, we can, you know, try and find ways to improve physical activity, um, but we can also find ways to improve movement right uh for through like things like gait retraining um and so those uh that's why i'm like really interested in seeing how these things piece together um and uh, so this is something that you could change for a patient tomorrow if, if there is this connection right i mean this is something that could be implemented almost immediately yeah, I think, I think there are a few things that we might need to like brush up on a little bit. I'm jumping the gun. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I do think that uh, there's a lot of promise um, with both gait retraining and physical activity. Um, it, it's just like trying to find a way that uh, we can get patient buy-in and clinician buy-in too, mm -hmm. uh, because you want to make sure that the interventions that you're applying are going to be things that the patients actually want to participate in um, and remain compliant in, uh, and also uh, things that clinicians will actually have time to implement uh, 
into their sessions or like don't need a ton of technology for because right. uh you know, you want to make sure that everyone has access to this Absolutely. regardless yeah. of their Not standard. everybody has a 3D biomechanics. <laughs> you know. Definitely so, not. I wish, I wish. That would be, what, so what is the data telling you? What, what are you seeing so far? Yeah, so we're seeing, you know, some of these, these linear relationships, I guess. Um, so uh, as... The, the people that have the, you know, lowest loading on the movement side are also the people that tend to have um, the lowest amount of daily steps that they take per day. Uh, but in general, uh, so that's like pretty problematic for that one group of individuals. Um, but we also see that there are people that are achieving um, decent physical activity. It's, okay. it's probably only about... Um, a third of the patients, um, which is, you know, a bummer. But uh, the other side is that they might be achieving good physical activity, but their biomechanics still might look poor compared to people who were uninjured. So this brings up the idea of like, um, uh, if someone has good physical activity, but poor uh, movement patterns, right. how is that going to affect them? And is that going to affect them differently from the people who have poor movement and poor uh, right. physical so activity? Do these things compound or is it, is it, could it be a one or the other type of situation? And, and how do you determine that in the clinic, which, which it would be? Yeah, there's certainly a bunch of evidence to um, suggest that physical activity is beneficial for so many health outcomes. Yeah, um, but especially osteoarthritis, you know, like there's a there's a a strong rec recommendation of uh, just trying to encourage people who have even who people who have osteoarthritis to get out there and move um, when they can. Um, and they're not having, you know, too much pain. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, and I, and I think especially, you know, for ACL reconstruction, I remember it's sort of like, don't move, don't move, don't move. You're in like an immobilizer right after surgery. And then all of a sudden they're like, okay, bend, walk. And you're, and you're like, wait a second, like this doesn't feel right. And so, you know, I think it, it's so beneficial to have somebody you know, uh, like an athletic trainer or physical therapist or, or, or somebody who can say, okay, this is how your knee needs to move specifically so that you don't have these then poor outcomes down the road. Well, this is super exciting, Caroline. I love talking about, you know, I, I don't get to practice anymore as an athletic trainer, but it, it, I always appreciate getting to kind of talk shop and, and, uh, you know, I, I, I do miss being out on the field occasionally, um, not in the snow <laughs> or the rain, 75 sunny in a football game. I miss that. <laughs> I don't miss the 6am practice and the, the late night, you know, that stuff. And, but yeah, yeah, I it's agree awesome. with you. Awesome. Well, I have loved chatting with you about your research and we're so excited to continue to follow you.